Section 81 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens, Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, 2019. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. Duvlaka wanted to know where the cows came from, and Monaghan told her that the King of Leinster had given them to him. She fell in love with them as Monaghan had done, but there was nobody in the world could have avoided loving those cows. Such cows they were, such wonders. Monaghan and Duvlaka used to play chess together, and then they would go out together and look at the cows, and then they would go in together and would talk to each other about the cows. Everything they did they did together, for they loved to be with each other. However, a change came. One morning a great noise of voices and trampling of horses and rattle of armor came about the palace. Monaghan looked from the window. "'Who is coming?' asked Duvlaka. But he did not answer her. "'The noise must announce the visit of a king,' Duvlaka continued. But Monaghan did not say a word. Duvlaka then went to the window. "'Who is that king?' she asked. And her husband replied to her then. "'That is the King of Leinster,' said he mournfully. "'Well,' said Duvlaka, surprised, "'is he not welcome?' "'He is welcome indeed,' said Monaghan lamentably. "'Let us go out and welcome him properly,' Duvlaka suggested. "'Let us not go near him at all,' said Monaghan, "'for he is coming to complete his bargain.' "'What bargain are you talking about?' Duvlaka asked. But Monaghan would not answer that. Let us go out, said he, for we must go out. Monaghan and Duvlaka went out then and welcomed the King of Leinster. They brought him and his chief men into the palace, and water was brought for their baths, and rooms were appointed for them, and everything was done that should be done for guests. That night there was a feast, and after the feast there was a banquet, and all through the feast and the banquet the King of Leinster stared at Duvlaka with joy and sometimes his breast was delivered of great sighs, and at times he moved as though in perturbation of spirit and mental agony. "'There is something wrong with the King of Leinster,' Duvlaka whispered. "'I don't care if there is,' said Monaghan. "'You must ask what he wants.' "'But I don't want to know it,' said Monaghan. "'Nevertheless, you must ask him,' she insisted. So Monaghan did ask him, and it was in a melancholy voice that he asked it. "'Do you want anything?' said he to the King of Leinster. "'I do indeed,' said Branduv. "'If it is an Ulster, I will get it for you,' said Monaghan mournfully. "'It is an Ulster,' said Branduv. Monaghan did not want to say anything more then, but the King of Leinster was so intent, and everybody else was listening, and Duvlaka was nudging his arm— so he said, "'What is it that you do want?' "'I want to Vlaka. "'I want her too,' said Monaghan. "'You made your bargain,' said the King of Leinster. "'My cows and their calves for your do Vlaka, "'and the man that makes a bargain keeps a bargain.' "'I never before heard,' said Monaghan, "'of a man giving away his own wife.' "'Even if you never heard of it before, "'you must do it now,' said Duvlaka for honor is longer than life. Monaghan became angry when Duvlaka said that. His face went red as a sunset, and the veins swelled in his neck and forehead. Do you say that? he cried to Duvlaka. I do, said Duvlaka. Let the King of Leinster take her, said Monaghan. End of chapter 11《Section 82 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens》Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter 12 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, 2020 Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens Duvlaka and the King of Leinster went apart then to speak together and the eye of the king seemed to be as big as a plate, so fevered was it and so enlarged and inflamed by the look of Duvlaka. 
he was so confounded with joy also that his words got mixed up with his teeth and duvlaka did not know exactly what it was he was trying to say and he did not seem to know himself but at last he did say something intelligible and this is what he said i am a very happy man said he and i said duvlaka am the happiest woman in the world why should you be happy the astonished king demanded listen to me she said if you tried to take me away from this place against my own wish one half of the men of ulster would be dead before you got me and the other half would be badly wounded in my defence a bargain is a bargain the king of leinster began but she continued they will not prevent my going away for they all know that i have been in love with you for ages what have you been in with me for ages said the amazed king in love with you replied duvlaka this is news said the king and it is good news but by my word said duvlaka i will not go with you unless you grant me a boon all that i have cried branduv and all that everybody has and you must pass your word and pledge your word that you will do what i ask i pass it and pledge it cried the joyful king then said duvlaka this is what i bind on you light the yoke he cried until one year is up and out you are not to pass the night in any house that i am in by my head and my hand branduv stammered and if you come into a house where i am during the time and term of that year you are not to sit down in the chair that i am sitting in heavy is my doom he groaned but said duvlaka if i am sitting in a chair or a seat you are to sit in a chair that is over against me and opposite to me and at a distance from me alas said the king and he smote his hands together and then he beat them on his head and then he looked at them and at everything about and he could not tell what anything was or where anything was for his mind was clouded and his wits had gone astray why do you bind these woes on me he pleaded i wish to find out if you truly love me but i do said the king i love you madly and dearly and with all my faculties and members that is the way love you said duvlaka we shall have a notable year of courtship and joy and let us go now she continued for i am impatient to be with you alas said branduv as he followed her alas alas said the king of leinster End of chapter 12「Section 83 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens, Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, 2020. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. I think, said the flame lady, that whoever lost that woman had no reason to be sad. Monaghan took her chin in his hand and kissed her lips. "'All that you say is lovely, for you are lovely,' said he, "'and you are my delight and the joy of the world.' Then the attendants brought him wine, and he drank so joyously of that and so deeply, that those who observed him thought he would surely burst and drown them. But he laughed loudly and with enormous delight, until the vessels of gold and silver and bronze chimed mellowly to his peal and the rafters of the house went creaking said he monaghan loved duvlaka of the white hand better than he loved his life better than he loved his honour the kingdoms of the world did not weigh with him besides the string of her shoe he would not look at a sunset if he could see her he would not listen to a harp if he could hear her speak for she was the delight of ages the gem of time and the wonder of the world till doom she went to leinster with the king of that country and when she had gone monaghan fell grievously sick so that it did not seem he could ever recover again 
and he began to waste and wither, and he began to look like a skeleton and a bony structure and a misery. Now this also must be known. Duvlaka had a young attendant who was her foster-sister as well as her servant, and on the day that she got married to Monaghan, her attendant was married to Mac and Duv, who was the servant and foster-brother to Monaghan. When Duvlaka went away with the king of Leinster, her servant, Mac and Duv's wife, went with her. So there were two wifeless men in Ulster at that time, namely Monaghan the king and Mac and Duv his servant. One day, as Monaghan sat in the sun, brooding lamentably on his fate, Mac and Duv came to him. "'How are things with you, master?' asked Mac and Duv. "'Bad,' said Monaghan. "'It was a poor day brought you off with Mananan to the land of promise,' said his servant. "'Why should you think that?' inquired Monaghan. "'Because,' said Mac and Duv, "'you learned nothing in the land of promise except how to eat a lot of food and how to do nothing in a deal of time.' "'What business is that of yours?' said Monaghan angrily. "'It is my business, surely,' said Mac and Duv, "'for my wife has gone off to Leinster with your wife, "'and she wouldn't have gone if you hadn't made a bet and a bargain with that accursed king.' "'Mac and Duv began to weep then. "'I didn't make a bargain with any king,' said he, "'and yet my wife has gone away with one, and it's all because of you.' "'There is no one sorrier for you than I am,' said Monaghan. "'There is indeed,' said Mac and Duv for I am sorrier myself. Monaghan roused himself then. You have a claim on me truly, said he, and I will not have any one with a claim on me that is not satisfied. Go, he said to Macanduv, to that very place we both know of. You remember the baskets I left there with the sod from Ireland in one and the sod from Scotland in the other. Bring me the baskets and sod. Tell me the why of this, said his servant. The King of Leinster will ask his wizards what I am doing, and this is what I will be doing. I will get on your back with a foot in each of the baskets, and when Branduv asks the wizard where I am, they will tell him that I have one leg in Ireland and one leg in Scotland, and as long as I tell him that, he will think he need not bother himself about me, and we will go into Leinster that way. Not a bad way either, said Mac and Duv. They set out then. End of chapter 13「Section 84 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter 14. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, 2020. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. It was a long, uneasy journey, for although Mac and Dew was of stout heart and good will, yet no man can carry another on his back from Ulster to Leinster and go quick. Still, if you keep on driving a pig or a story, they will get at last to where you wish them to go, and the man who continues putting one foot in front of the other will leave his home behind, and will come at last to the edge of the sea and the end of the world. When they reached Leinster, the feast of my life was being held, and they pushed on by forced marches and long stages so as to be in time, and thus they came to the Moy of Kelcomane, and they mixed with the crowd that were going to the feast. A great and joyous concourse of people streamed about them. There were young men and young girls, and when these were not holding each other's hands, it was because their arms were round each other's necks. There were old lusty women going by, and when these were not talking, it was because their mouths were mutually filled with apples and meat pies. There were young warriors with mantles of green and purple and red, flying behind them on the breeze. And when these were not looking disdainfully on older soldiers, it was because the older soldiers happened at that moment to be looking at them. There were old warriors with yard-long beards flying behind their shoulders like wisps of hay, and when these were not nursing a broken arm or a cracked skull, it was because they were nursing wounds in their stomachs or their legs. There were troops of young women who giggled as long as their breaths lasted and beamed when it gave out bands of boys who whispered mysteriously together and pointed with their fingers in every direction at once and would suddenly begin to run like a herd of stampeded horses. 
There were men with carts full of roasted meats, women with little vats full of mead, and others carrying milk and beer, folk of both sorts with towers swaying on their heads and they dripping with honey, children having baskets piled with red apples, and old women who peddled shellfish and boiled lobsters. There were people who sold twenty kinds of bread, with butter thrown in, sellers of onions and cheese, and others who supplied spare bits of armor, odd scabbards, spear handles, breastplate laces, people who cut your hair or told your fortune, or gave you a hot bath in a pot, others who put a shoe on your horse or a piece of embroidery on your mantle, and others again who took stains off your sword, or dyed your fingernails, or sold you a hound. It was a great and joyous gathering that was going to the feast. Monaghan and his servants sat against a grassy hedge by the roadside and watched the multitude streaming past. Just then Monaghan glanced to the right once the people were coming. Then he pulled the hood of his cloak over his ears and over his brow. Alas, said he in a deep and anguished voice. Mac and Duve turned to him. Is it a pain in your stomach, master? It is not, said Monaghan. Well, what made you make that brutal and belching noise? It was a sigh I gave, said Monaghan. Whatever it was, said Mackindoo, what was it? Look down the road on this side and tell me who is coming, said his master. It is a lord with his troop. It is the king of Leinster, said Monaghan. The man, said Mackindoo, in a tone of great pity, the man that took away your wife. And, he roared in a voice of extraordinary savagery, the man that took away my wife into the bargain and she not in the bargain. Hush, said Monaghan, for a man who heard his shout stopped to tie a sandal or to listen. Master, said Mackandoove, as the troop drew abreast and moved past, what is it, my good friend? Let me throw a little small piece of a rock at the King of Leinster. I will not. A little bit only, a small bit about twice the size of my head. I will not let you, said Monaghan. When the king had gone by, Macandu groaned a deep and dejected groan. Och, on, said he. Och, on, yo gojo, said he. The man who had tied his sandal said then, Are you in pain, honest man? I am not in pain, said Macandu. Well, what was it that knocked a howl out of you like the whelp of a sick dog, honest man? Go away, said Macandu. Go away, you flat-faced, nosy person. There is no politeness left in this country, said the stranger, and he went away to a certain distance, and from thence he threw a stone at Macandu's nose, and hit it. End of chapter 14《セクション85 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens》Monaghan's Frenzy Chapter 15 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan.《Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens》The road was now not so crowded as it had been. Minutes would pass and only a few travelers would come and minutes more would go when nobody was in sight at all. Then two men came down the road. They were clerics. "'I never saw that kind of uniform before,' said Mac Antuve. "'Even if you didn't,' said Bonnigan, "'there are plenty of them about. "'They are men that don't believe in our gods,' said he. "'Do they not indeed?' said Mac Antuve. "'The rascals!' said he. "'What, what would Mananan say to that?' "'The one in front carrying the big book is to braid.' He is the priest of Kelgamain, and he is the chief of the two. Indeed and indeed, said Macandouve. The one behind must be his servant, for he has a load on his back. The priests were reading their offices, and Macandouve marveled at that. What is it they are doing? said he. They are reading. Indeed and indeed they are, said Macandouve. I can't make out a word of the language except that man behind says Amen, Amen, every time the man in front puts a grunt out of him. And I don't like our gods at all, 
said Mac and Duve. They do not. Play a trick on them, master, said Mac and Duve. Monaghan agreed to play a trick on the priests. He looked about them hard for a minute, and then he waved his hand at them. The two priests stopped, and they stared straight in front of them. Then they looked at each other, and then they looked at the sky. The clerk began to bless himself, and then to braid began to bless himself, and after that they didn't know what to do. For where there had been a road with a hedge on each side and fields stretching beyond them, there was now no road, no hedge, no field, but there was a great broad river sweeping across their path, a mighty tumble of yellow-brown waters, very swift, very savage, churning and billowing and jockeying among rough boulders and islands of stone. It was a water of villainous depth and of detestable wetness, of ugly hurrying and of desolate cavernous sound, and at a little to their right there was a thin, uncomely bridge that waggled across the torrent. To Braid rubbed his eyes, and then he looked again. "'Do you see what I see?' said he to the clerk. "'I don't know what you see,' said the clerk. "'But what I see I never did see before, and I wish I did not see it now.' "'I was born in this place,' said Debraid. "'My father was born here before me, and my grandfather was born here before him. "'But until this day and this minute I never saw a river here before, and I never heard of one.' "'What will we do at all?' said the clerk. "'What will we do at all?' "'We will be sensible,' said Debraid sternly. "'And we will go about our business,' said he. "'If rivers fall out of the sky, what has that to do with you?' And if there is a river here, which there is, why, thank God, there is a bridge over it, too. Would you put a toe on that bridge, said the clerk? What is the bridge for, said to Braid. Monaghan and Macandu followed them. When they got to the middle of the bridge, it broke under them, and they were precipitated into that boiling yellow flood. Monaghan snatched at the book as it fell from to Braid's hand. Won't you let them drown, master, asked Macandu. No, said Monaghan. I'll send them a mile down the stream, and then they can come to land. Monaghan then took on himself the form of Tebraid, and he turned Mac and Duve into the shape of the clerk. My head has gone bald, said the servant in a whisper. That is part of it, replied Monaghan. So long as we know, said Mac and Duve. They went on then to meet the King of Leinster. End of chapter 15《Section 86 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens》Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, 2020. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. They met him near the place where the games were played. "'Good my soul to braid!' cried the King of Leinster, and he gave Monaghan a kiss. Monaghan kissed him back again. "'Amen, amen,' said Mac and Duve. "'What for?' said the King of Leinster. And then Mac and Duve began to sneeze, for he didn't know what for. "'It is a long time since I saw you to braid,' said the King. "'But at this minute I am in great haste and hurry.' Go you on before me to the fortress, and you can talk to the queen that you'll find there, she that used to be the king of Ulster's wife. Kevin Kochlach, my charioteer, will go with you, and I will follow you myself in a while. The king of Leinster went off then, and Monaghan and his servant went with the charioteer and the people. Monaghan read away out of the book, for he found it interesting, and he did not want to talk to the charioteer. And Mac and Duve cried, Amen, Amen, every time that Monaghan took his breath. The people who were going with them said to one another that Mac and Duve was a queer kind of clerk, and that they had never seen any one who had such a mouthful of Amens. But in a while they came to the fortress, and they got into it without any trouble, for Kevin Kochlach, the king's charioteer, brought them in. Then they were led to the room where Duve Laka was. And as he went into that room, Monaghan shut his eyes, for he did not want to look at Duvlaka while other people might be looking at him. "'Let everybody leave this room while I am talking to the queen,' said he. And all the attendants left the room, except one, and she wouldn't go, for she wouldn't leave her mistress. 
Then Monaghan opened his eyes, and he saw Duvlaka, and he made a great bound to her and took her in his arms, and Mac and Duv made a savage and vicious and terrible jump at the attendant, and took her in his arms and bit her ear and kissed her neck and whipped down into her back. "'Go away!' said the girl. "'Unhand me, villain!' said she. "'I will not,' said Mac and Duv, "'for I'm your own husband. I'm your own Mac, your little Mac, your Mackie whack whack then the attendant gave a little squeal, and she bit him on each ear and kissed his neck and wept down into his back, and said that it wasn't true and that it was. End of chapter 16 Section 87 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens Modigan's Frenzy, Chapter 17 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, 2020. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens But they were not alone, although they thought they were. The hag that guarded the jewels was in the room. She sat hunched up against the wall, and as she looked like a bundle of rags, they did not notice her. She began to speak then. "'Terrible are the things I see,' said she. "'Terrible are the things I see.' Monaghan and his servant gave a jump of surprise, and their two wives jumped and squealed. Then Monaghan puffed out his cheeks till his face looked like a bladder, and he blew a magic breath at the hag so that she seemed to be surrounded by a fog, and when she looked through that breath everything seemed to be different to what she had thought. Then she began to beg everyone's pardon. I had an evil vision, said she. I saw crossways. How sad it is that I should begin to see the sort of things that I thought I saw. Sit in the chair, mother, said Monaghan, and tell me what you thought you saw. And he slipped a spike under her, and Mac and Duve pushed her into the seat, and she died on the spike. Just then there came a knocking at the door. Mac and Duv opened it, and there was De Braid standing outside, and twenty-nine of his men were with him, and they were all laughing. A mile was not half enough, said Mac and Duv reproachfully. The chamberlain of the fortress pushed into the room, and he stared from one De Braid to the other. This is a fine growing year, said he. There never was a year when De Braids were as plentiful as they are this year. There is a De Braid outside, and there is a De Braid inside. "'And who knows but there are some more of them under the bed. "'The place is crawling with them,' said he. "'Monaghan pointed at Braid. "'Don't you know who that is?' he cried. "'I know who he says he is,' said the Chamberlain. "'Well, he is Monaghan,' said Monaghan. "'And these twenty-nine men are twenty-nine of his nobles from Ulster.' "'At that news the men of the household picked up clubs and cudgels "'and every kind of thing that was near, "'and made a violent and woeful attack on Braid's men. "'The King of Leinster came in then, "'and when he was told Braid was Monaghan, "'he attacked them as well. "'And it was with difficulty that Braid got away to Kelcomain "'with nine of his men, and they all wounded. "'The King of Leinster came back then. "'He went to Duvlaka's room. "'Where is Braid?' said he. It wasn't to break what's here, said the hag, who was still sitting on the spike and was not half dead. It was Monaghan. Why did you let him near you? said the king to Duvlaka. There is no one who has a better right to be near me than Monaghan has, said Duvlaka. He is my own husband, said she. And then the king cried out in dismay, I have beaten to Braid's people. He rushed from the room. "'Send for De Braid till I apologize," he cried. "'Tell him it was all a mistake. Tell him it was Monaghan!' End of chapter 17 Section 88 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter 18 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle, from Michigan, 2020. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens Monaghan and his servant went home, and, for what pleasure is greater than that of memory exercised in conversation, 
for a time the feeling of an adventure well accomplished kept him in some contentment but at the end of a time that pleasure was worn out and monaghan grew at first dispirited and then sullen and after that as ill as he had been on the previous occasion for he could not forget duvlaka of the white hand and he could not remember her without longing and despair it was in the illness which comes from longing and despair that he sat one day looking on the world that was black although the sun shone and that was lean and unwholesome although autumn fruits were heavy on the earth and the joys of harvest were about him winter is in my heart quoth he and i am cold already he thought too that some day he would die and the thought was not unpleasant for one half of his life was away in the territories of the king of leinster and the half that he kept in himself had no spice in it he was thinking in this way when mac and Duve came toward him over the lawn and he noticed that mac and Duve was walking like an old man he took little slow steps and he did not loosen his knees when he walked so he went stiffly one of his feet turned pitifully outwards and the other turned lamentably in his chest was pulled inwards and his head was stuck outwards and hung down in the place where his chest should have been and his arms were crooked in front of him with the hands turned wrongly so that one palm was shown to the east of the world and the other one was turned to the west how goes it mac and Duve, said the king bad said mac and Duve. is that the sun i see shining my friend the king asked it may be the sun replied mac and Duve, peering curiously at the golden radiance that dozed about them but maybe it's a yellow fog what is life at all said the king it is a weariness and a tiredness said mac and Duve. it is a long yawn without sleepiness it is a bee lost at midnight and buzzing on a pane it is the noise made by a tied-up dog it is nothing worth dreaming about it is nothing at all how well you explain my feelings about duvlaka said the king i was thinking about my own lamb said mac and Duve. i was thinking about my own treasure my cup of cheeriness and the pulse of my heart and with that he burst into tears alas said the king but sobbed mac and Duve, what right have i to complain i am only the servant and although i didn't make any bargain with the king of leinster or with any king of them all yet my wife is gone away as if she was the consort of a potentate the same as duvlaka is monaghan was sorry then for his servant and he roused himself i am going to send you to duvlaka where the one is the other will be cried mac and Duve joyously go said monaghan to rath the skirt of bregia you know the place as well as my tongue knows my teeth Duvlaka is there. See her and ask her what she wants me to do. Mac and Duve went there and returned. Duvlaka says that you are to come at once, for the King of Leinster is journeying around his territory, and Kevin Cochlach, the charioteer, is making bitter love to her and wants her to run away with him. Monaghan set out, and in no great time, for they travelled night and day, they came to Bregla and gained admittance to the fortress but just as he got in he had to go out again for the king of leinster had been warned of monaghan's journey and came back to his fortress in the nick of time when the men of ulster saw the condition into which monaghan fell they were in great distress and they all got sick through compassion for their king the nobles suggested to him that they should march against leinster and kill that king and bring back duvlaka but monaghan would not consent to this plan for said he the thing i lost through my own folly i shall get back through my own craft and when he said that his spirits revived and he called for mac and Duve. you know my friend said monaghan that i can't get duvlaka back unless the king of leinster asks me to take her back for a bargain is a bargain that will happen when pigs fly said mac and Duve. and said he i did not make any bargain with the king that is in the world i heard you say that before said monaghan i will say it till doom cried his servant for my wife has gone away with that pestilent king and he has got the double of your bad bargain monaghan and his servant then set out for leinster when they neared that country they found a great crowd going on the road with them and they learned that the king was giving a feast in honour of his marriage to duvlaka for the year of waiting was nearly out and the king had sworn he would delay it no longer 
They went on, therefore, but in low spirits, and at last they saw the walls of the king's castle towering before them, and a noble company going to and fro on the lawn. End of section 18「Section 89 of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens, Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter 19. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, 2020. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. They sat in a place where they could watch the castle and compose themselves after their journey. "'How are we going to get into the castle?' asked Mac and Duve. For there were hatchet-men on guard in the big gateway, and there were spearmen at short intervals around the walls, and men to throw hot porridge off the roof were standing in the right places. "'If we cannot get in by hook, we will get in by crook,' said Monaghan. "'They are both good ways,' said Mac and Duve. "'And whichever of them you decide on, I'll stick by.' Just then they saw the hag of the mill coming out of the mill which was down the road a little. Now the hag of the mill was a bony, thin pull of a hag with odd feet. That is, she had one foot that was too big for her, so that when she lifted it up it pulled her over, and she had one foot that was too small for her, so that when she lifted it up she didn't know what to do with it. She was so long that you thought you would never see the end of her, and she was so thin that you thought you didn't see her at all. One of her eyes was set where her nose should have been, and there was an ear in its place, and her nose itself was hanging out of her chin, and she had whiskers round it. She was dressed in a red rag that was really a hole with a fringe on it, and she was singing, Oh, hush thee, my one love, to a cat that was yelping on her shoulder. She had a tall skinny dog behind her called Broter. It hadn't a tooth in his head except one, and it had the toothache in that tooth. Every few steps it used to sit down on its hunkers and point its nose straight upwards and make a long, sad complaint about its tooth. And after that it used to reach its hind leg round to try to scratch out its tooth. And then it used to be pulled on again by the straw rope that was around its neck, and which was tied at the other end to the hag's heaviest foot. There was an old, knock-kneed, raw-boned, one-eyed, little, winded, heavy-headed mare with her also. Every time it put a front leg forward, it shivered all over the rest of its legs backwards. And when it put a hind leg forward, it shivered all over the rest of its legs frontwards. And it used to give a great whistle through its nose when it was out of breath, and a big, thin hen was sitting on its croup. Monaghan looked on the hag of the mill with delight and affection. This time, said he to Mac Anduve, I'll get back my wife. You will indeed, said Mac Anduve heartily, and you'll get mine back too. "'Go over yonder,' said Manigan, "'and tell the hag of the mill that I want to talk to her.' Mac and Duve brought her over to him. "'Is it true what the servant-man said?' she asked. "'What did he say?' said Monaghan. "'He said you wanted to talk to me.' "'It is true,' said Monaghan. "'This is a wonderful hour and a glorious minute,' said the hag, "'for this is the first time in sixty years that anyone wanted to talk to me. "'Talk on now.' said she, and I'll listen to you if I can remember how to do it. Talk gently, said she, the way you won't disturb the animals, for they are all sick. They are sick indeed, said Macandu pityingly. The cat has a sore tail, said she, by reason of sitting too close to a part of the hob that was hot. The dog has a toothache, the horse has a pain in her stomach, and the hen has the pip. "'Ah, oh, it's a sad world,' said Mac and Duve. "'There you are,' said the hag. "'Tell me,' Monaghan commenced, "'if you got a wish, what is it you would wish for?' The hag took the cat off her shoulder and gave it to Mac and Duve. "'Hold that for me while I think,' said she. "'Would you like to be a lovely young girl?' asked Monaghan. "'It'd sooner be that than a skin deal,' said she. And would you like to marry me or the King of Leinster? <laughs> I'd like to marry either of you or both of you or whichever of you come first. <laughs> Very well, said Monaghan. You shall have your wish. He touched her with his finger, and the instant he touched her, all dilapidation and wryness and age went from her, 
and she became so beautiful that one dared scarcely look at her and so young that she seemed but sixteen years of age you are not the hag of the mill any longer said monaghan you are ivel of the shining cheeks daughter of the king of munster he touched the dog too and it became a little silky lap-dog that could nestle in your palm then he changed the old mare into a brisk piebald palfrey then he changed himself so that he became the living image of a the son of the king of Connaught, who had just been married to ivel of the shining cheeks and then he changed mac anduv into the likeness of a's attendant and then they all set off towards the fortress singing that song that begins my wife is nicer than any one's wife any one's wife any one's wife my wife is much nicer than any one's wife which nobody can deny end of section nineteen Section ninety of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. Monaghan's Frenzy, Chapter twenty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Michelle from Michigan, two thousand twenty. Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens. The doorkeeper brought word to the king of Leinster that the son of the king of Connaught, A the Beautiful, and his wife, Ivel of the Shining Cheeks, were at the door, that they had been banished from Connaught by A's father, and they were seeking the protection of the king of Leinster. Branduve came to the door himself to welcome them, and the minute he looked on Ivel of the Shining Cheeks, it was plain that he liked looking at her. It was now drawing towards evening, and a feast was prepared for the guests with the banquet to follow it. At the feast Duvlaka sat beside the king of Leinster, but Monaghan sat opposite him with Ivel, and Monaghan put more and more magic into the hag, so that her cheeks shone and her eyes gleamed, and she was utterly bewitching to the eye. And when Branduve looked at her she seemed to grow more and more lovely and more and more desirable, and at last there was not a bone in his body as big as an inch that was not filled with love and longing for the girl. Every few minutes he gave a great sigh as if he had eaten too much, and when Duvlaka asked him if he had eaten too much he said he had, but that he had not drunk enough, and by that he meant he had not drunk enough from the eyes of the girl before him. At the banquet which was then held he looked at her again, and every time he took a drink he toasted Ivel across the brim of his goblet, and in a little while she began to toast him back across the rim of her cup, for he was drinking ale, but she was drinking mead. Then he sent a messenger to her to say that it was a far better thing to be the wife of the king of Leinster than to be the wife of the son of the king of Connaught, for a king is better than a prince. And Ivel thought that this was as wise a thing as anybody had ever said. And then he sent a message to say that he loved her so much that he would certainly burst of love if it did not stop. Monaghan heard the whispering, and he told the hag that if she did what he advised she would certainly get either himself or the king of Leinster for a husband. "'Either of you will be welcome,' said the hag. "'When the king says he loves you, ask him to prove it by gifts. Ask him for his drinking horn first. She asked for that, and he sent it to her filled with good liquor. Then she asked for his girdle, and he sent her that.' His people argued with him and said it was not right that he should give away the treasures of Leinster to the wife of the king of Connaught's son. But he said that it did not matter, for when he got the girl he would get his treasures with her. But every time he sent anything to the hag, Mac and Duve snatched it out of her lap and put it in his pocket. Now, said Monaghan to the hag, tell the servant to say that you would not leave your own husband for all the wealth of the world. She told the servant that, and the servant told it to the king. When Branduve heard it he nearly went mad with love and longing and jealousy, and with rage also, because of the treasure he had given her and might not get back. He called Monaghan over to him, and spoke to him very threateningly and ragingly. "'I am not one who takes a thing without giving a thing,' said he. "'Nobody could say you were,' agreed Monaghan. "'Do you see this woman sitting beside me?' he continued, pointing to Duvlaka. "'I do, indeed,' said Monaghan. "'Well,' said Branduve, "'this woman is Duvlaka of the white hand that I took away from Monaghan. She is just going to marry me, 
But if you will make an exchange, you can marry this Duvlaka here, and I will marry that Ivel of the Shining Cheeks yonder. Monaghan pretended to be very angry then. If I had come here with horses and treasures, you would be in your right to take these from me, but you have no right to ask for what you are now asking. I do ask for it, said Branduve menacingly, and you must not refuse a lord. Very well, said Monaghan reluctantly, and as if in great fear. If you will make the exchange, I will make it, although it breaks my heart. He brought Ivel over to the king then, and gave her three kisses. The king would suspect something if I did not kiss you, said he, and then he gave the hag over to the king. After that they all got drunk and merry, and soon there was a great snoring and snorting, and very soon all the servants fell asleep also, so that Monaghan could not get anything to drink. Mac and Duve said it was a great shame, and he kicked some of the servants, but they did not budge, and then he slipped out to the stables and saddled two mares. He got on one with his wife behind him, and Monaghan got on the other with Duvlaka behind him, and they rode away towards Ulster like the wind, singing this song, The King of Leinster was married today, married today, married today, the King of Leinster was married today, and everyone wishes him joy. In the morning the servants came to waken the King of Leinster, and when they saw the face of the hag lying on the pillow beside the king, and her nose all covered with whiskers, and her big foot and little foot sticking away out at the end of the bed. They began to laugh, and poke one another in the stomachs, and thump one another on the shoulders, so that the noise awakened the king, and he asked what was the matter with him at all. It was then he saw the hag lying beside him, and he gave a great screech and jumped out of bed. "'Aren't you the hag of the mill?' said he. "'I am indeed,' she replied, "'and I love you dearly.' "'I wish I didn't see you,' said Branduve. That was the end of the story, and when he had told it, Monaghan began to laugh uproariously and called for more wine. He drank this deeply, as though he was full of thirst and despair and wild jollity, but when the flame lady began to weep, he took her in his arms and caressed her, and said that she was the love of his heart and the one treasure of the world. After that they feasted in great contentment, and at the end of the feasting they went away from fairy and returned to the world of men. They came to Monaghan's palace at Moylini, and it was not until they reached the palace that they found they had been away one whole year, for they had thought they were only away one night. They lived then peacefully and lovingly together, and that ends the story. But Brotiarna did not know that Monaghan was Fionn. The abbot leaned forward. Was Monaghan Fionn? he asked in a whisper. He was, replied Cariete. Indeed, indeed, said the abbot. After a while he continued, There is only one part of your story that I do not like. What part is that? asked Cariete. It is the part where the holy man to braid is ill-treated by that rap, by that, by Monaghan. Cariete agreed that it was ill-done. But to himself he said gleefully that whenever he was asked to tell the story of how he told the story of Monaghan, he would remember what the abbot said. End of Monaghan's Frenzy End of Irish Fairy Tales by James Stevens, 1905-1910